Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, and welcome. A little bit different today. Um, I tried to find a, a replacement, but it just wasn't possible. So we'll rely upon modern technology, and um, God willing, we'll still get to hear the word today and learn from the word today. Let us let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father God, for everyone that gathers around this word this morning whether they be here physically present or whether they be joining us online or watching it at a later date. Your word remains true and this is the word that is preached, your word that is preached, your word that is taught and your word, Father, that we have come to hear. Father, as every week I say and I will say it again, let there be none of me involved in this word. May I just solely be the messenger and you be the message. The message of your son, the message of his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension and his return, his triumphant return. May the message be Christ Jesus, the gospel of Christ Jesus. Father, I pray that as we gather around your words right now, that you will just open our hearts and open our intellects, open our minds through and by your Holy Spirit to illuminate this word to us that this word is nourishable, that we can digest it, feed on it, grow stronger through it and learn from it. That when we leave here, when we leave this place, that we can go out into this dark world as shining beacons, fed, nourished, fit, to be used for the purpose which you've called us to be used for. We ask all this in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, to his glory and honour and praise. Amen. Well, we're currently going through the, the epistle of First Peter. First uh, Peter was written to the dispersed Jews and the new churches that were in, uh, now in what we know as modern day Turkey. So I just want us to drop back a little bit before we start today, just so we can get the context of where we're reading and why we're reading where we are. Um, let's go to 13, verse 13, and we'll read through to 15. So just two verses, okay? 1 Peter 1, verse 13. Therefore, having girded your minds for action, being sober, in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not as being conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you to be holy yourselves in all your conduct. Verse 16, because it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy so back in verse 14 there Peter writes as obedient children not being conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance but like the holy one who called you verse 15 be holy yourselves in also in all your conduct Peter's epistle to the dispersed Christians the new churches is powerfully powerful and it's packed with facts. And he was writing, and he's writing today. But you imagine his writing at that time would have inspired and encouraged those to whom it was originally written to be getting a letter from one of Jesus' closest known people, one of his inner circle, the, the Apostle Peter. Must have been very encouraging, but it's just as encouraging today as it was when it was originally written mankind has not changed material things around us may be yes but the fallenness of us the sinfulness nature of us the selfishness of us has not changed has not changed one bit it remains so the apostle writes as obedient children not being conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance obedience and the life of holiness is not and cannot be produced by passiveness or from passiveness. It demands that we make an active choice to, a, to adopt a correct attitude, to initiate right thinking. And this requires us to be actively reading and meditating on the Word of God. Otherwise, 
We're not informed, otherwise we don't know. To be worshippers and to love and fellowship with our brothers and sisters in the faith. We need to know the word. We need to know and we need to be obedient to that word. Right actions lead to holy living. And we are, as Peter writes, not to be conformed to our former and previous lusts and worldly desires and pursuits. The Apostle Paul wrote similarly in, in, uh, in the book of Romans to the churches in Rome, in Romans 12 verse 2. Romans 12 verse 2, the Apostle Paul wrote, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may approve what the will of God is, that which is good and that which is pleasing and perfect. Interesting. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the Apostle Paul wrote, not by giving your heart or saying a prayer. It requires the intellect. The world will always pressure us to live sinfully and selfishly. But to live a good life, the life that God wants from us, requires a change in how we behave, requires a change in what we desire, requires a change in, I guess, in our wants. This change is only possible by the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit and by and through the word of God. If your behaviour and your attitudes, desires have not changed since you became born again, or you made a commitment, then you need to do a serious inventory of your life to see whether you're really saved or not. It is said that obedience that comes from faith is the obedience of a son, not a slave. In the Greek it denotes possession and in this context it denotes the characteristic and ruling nature of the newly newborn readers again remember that these these are new churches these these were new churches that were planted and undergoing persecution from inside and from outside so obedience to the word obedience to the letters they were receiving from from the apostles obedience to the scriptures which they already had and Peter writes here children of obedience well we're ch children of God if we're born again and regenerate then we're children of God yes we've been adopted into his family so children of obedience we're to be obedient those who are obedient obedience is their character obedience should be our character as true regenerate believers Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the famous German evangelist, he wrote, only he who believes is obedient. Only he who is obedient believes. I repeat that. Only he who believes is obedient. Only he who is obedient believes. Peter is actually making a really deep statement here. And for us, especially in light of many pulpits today, you know, there are those that teach that you can say you believe in Jesus and spend your life just living like the devil, yet you're still arrive in heaven because you once put your hand up at a meeting or you made a commitment of faith or something. That is not living a life of obedience. To believe in Jesus, to believe in God, most people will agree maybe. Most people will say to you, yeah, I believe in a God. but not the God necessarily of the Bible or Jesus of the Bible. They believe in a God that they've created, a God they've manufactured. That's an idol. That's not the God of the Bible. And the reason they've done that is because they don't want to know the God of the Bible. They don't want to be submissive to the God of the Bible. They don't want to be obedient to the God of the Bible. They have no knowledge of him. And they're not interested in him. They've got their own God. They've got their own way to heaven. And they're all right. That's not the truth. That's their idol. And that's where they base their morals and standards upon. Yet these people often think they will arrive safely in paradise upon their passing because they once repeated a prayer in a meeting or they filled out a form and they were informed by someone who said, you're saved. 
this is so sad and totally incorrect the evidence of knowing God is obeying God Jesus said you shall know them by their fruits and if these Christians do not display their fruits I leave you to work that one out this is effectively what Jesus was alluding to when, when he said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Say this nearly every week. But it's such an important scripture. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus? Or, or, or is your faith just a habit? It's something you've done since you was a child or something you've done for the past 10, 15 years. Do you love Jesus? Because if you truly love Jesus, then you'll keep his commandments. And Peter's point that he's making here in his epistle is simply that now, as Christians, their lifestyle is not to conform to the base desires that previously controlled them and kept them from God. All Christians must not allow the world to squeeze them into its sinful mould. And that's what the world wants to do. The devil rules in the world and he will do everything and does do everything to distract the Christian from doing what the Christian should do. From having your quiet time, your prayer time, your Bible reading time, your Bible study time, from going to church, for spending time in fellowship, for talking about the wonderful things of creation and God. The devil is real and he will put so many distractions in your way to stop you. And you'll go maybe a day without reading your word and that will go to two days, that will go to three days and slowly you'll be eroded and you'll become weak and powerless to resist you get into that later in the epistle of Peter we mustn't allow the world to squeeze it us into its mould we mustn't allow the world to come into the church we mustn't allow the world to come into our lifestyle we belong to a different kingdom and this is again part of what Peter is alluding to here Peter encourages Christians to control their desires rather than to be controlled by them. And he states formally, formally, before, they were in ignorance, but now they have come to know God and his will. Formerly, I was in ignorance. Formerly, maybe you was in ignorance, or maybe you're hearing this for the first time, and all of a sudden, the light and the truth has come on. If Jesus is alive, and Jesus is God, and if Jesus is alive, then God's alive, and... I've got to shape up. A life of ignorance is characterised by futility. It is a life that, eternally speaking, is going nowhere except for the lake of fire. In the times of writing in, in both Greece and in Rome, homosexuality and all kinds of vulgar practices were so common that they had come to be looked upon as, as natural, as normal. The ancient, sophisticated world was driven and mastered by lusts with the aim of being to find newer and wilder ways of gratifying the cravings, the cravings of the flesh, the cravings of the old nature that we inherited from Adam, all of us, from the time of Adam to the time now and to the time in the future. Not much different today, is it? Not much different today. In fact, I feel it's possibly worse because now we're called to accept and to celebrate such behaviour and if we don't, we're in the wrong. If you notice how subtly it's, it, these, these behaviours are put on your t television now or on your, on your favourite series or even on their commercials. The commercials will always promote something that, that you must have you know, the next new car or the next new washing machine or washing powder and it makes it look really special. 
but now they're subtly introducing homosexual partners as the norm it's not the norm but it's it's indoctrination and we're not to accept it we're not to just sit back and fold our arms and go well whatever this is the world and this is what the world desires but our kingdom our world is elsewhere and that's where our desires are supposed to be in verse 15 Peter continues but like the holy one who called you be holy yourselves also in all your conduct holiness embraces purity and moral integrity Peter again adds the truth that we are called that we are elect that we are chosen the holy one who called you he writes and in verse 16 he writes because it is written be holy for I am holy the holy one who called you because it is written be holy as I for I am holy those called to be God's children are to be like him and Peter reinforces this command by citing from Leviticus Leviticus 11 44 to 45 Leviticus 11, 44, 45, I'll read it. I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am holy. Do not make yourselves unclean by any creature that moves along the ground. I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. Therefore, be holy, because I am holy. We are adopted into his family. If we are born again Christians, we have been adopted into the family of God. We agree with that. Not everyone is a child of God. Only those that are adopted into his family are children of God. That's kind of common sense, yeah? So it's, it's natural, isn't it, that we should take on the attributes of our father. We see that in the natural world. We see children. And as we see them growing up, we knew their parents. We often say, you, you sound just like your father. You look just like your father. You act like your father. Well, that's how we should be. We're adopted into his family. And we should start to reflect the attributes of our father. And that, that attribute is his holiness. Be holy, for I am holy. The holy one who called you. The basic idea of holiness in the Bible is that of separation from all that is secular. If it is not Christian, then it is anti-Christian. And I'll say that again. If it is not Christian, it is anti-Christian. If we get caught up in, in conversations that are anti-God, then is it worth us putting ourselves out? Are they listening? Are they, are they receptive to what we're saying? Because if they're not, then just walk away. If we're watching a, a movie... Or, or a TV series and it's promoting things that are anti-Christian don't just go okay that'll be over in a minute switch it off switch it off the world and all its lusts all its desires want to drag you and will drag you away it will you are not strong enough. Not on your own. This is why Christ said that he would give us a helper, the Holy Spirit. This is why we can overcome, not because of anything great that we are, but who is in us is greater than he that is in the world. He in us will overcome. When we try to do the overcoming, that is works. And we will fail. We'll get frustrated and we will fail. But when we're obedient and we allow the Holy Spirit, we allow the Word to minister to us, to teach us, to feed us, to nourish us, then we grow and we grow in the Word and we grow in His Spirit and we grow stronger. We are to be set aside. The simplest definition of holiness is that of conformity to God's commands and to His Son. I want to conclude here, actually, and
and uh, we pick up the application because I think the application is screaming off the pages to be honest but it's true that people all over the world and whoever they are imitate the God whom they follow the God whom they worship we've seen that haven't we with the little red spots or they have the henna on their hands or the way they dress the way they act it's kind of a, a reflection of the God that they that they worship and they will form a character in accordance with his or hers and will regard what, what they do as right and will practice freely what they are supposed to do and what they approve of. Therefore, by knowing what are the characteristics of the gods which are worshipped by any people, we are able to form a correct assessment of the character from the people themselves. We see what they do, we see what they worship, we see what they value, we see what their morals are, and we get an idea from them of their God, who they follow and worship. On the, con on the, on the flip side of that then, surely, as God, who is the, the object of every Christian's worship, is perfectly holy, the character of his worshippers should always also be holy. That is what people should be seeing in you. Peace, quietness, holiness. As we previously said, the worship of impure gods of, of pagan paganism moulds the character of the worshippers into their image. So therefore then the worship of a biblical god is to mould the character of his chosen into his image. We are to become like him. And holiness essentially defines the Christian's new nature, the Christian's new conduct in contrast with his previous salvation lifestyle, which is again what Peter was adhering to. To be or to live a holy life does, does not imply in any way that we are to build monasteries or to avoid contact with the world. It's, that's not what the biblical term of holiness is implying. Today and in the past, many take this so much out of context, saying and teaching that Christians are to avoid using electricity or driving cars, using modern appliances. Uh, wearing modern fashionable clothing, lipstick, makeup, jewellery, that Christians shouldn't attend movies or music concerts or sporting events and dances. That's not, however, how God intended these verses to be applied. And some others would then think that holiness is limited to an affinity just for, for prayer and Bible study that we shut ourselves away and we become holier than thou. Again, that's not what's implied. God made all things and through him all things are made. He wants us to enjoy his creation. Otherwise he wouldn't have made it. And to enjoy his creation means we have to go out means we have to mix with other people. To enjoy his creation, we need to be out amongst the others, but we're to be lights in the darkness of the world. So there are many things in God's creation that we should and we can enjoy, and enjoy it passionately. Music, sport, concerts, games, physical exercise, Dancing, literature, plays, drama, marriage, having children, teaching, travelling, having friends, going to the beach, science, technology, all these things, the list is endless. So being holy isn't the case of shutting yourself off and having nothing to do with the rest of the world. No, no, no. Being holy is your attitude. And it should be recognised by those around you. And Peter is telling his readers 
exactly that. That is what Peter is saying. He says this, look, be holy yourselves also in all your conduct. Actions speak louder than words. It doesn't mean you go around judging people, it's just in your conduct. So what is then true holiness? What? How do we define this holiness that, that Peter and, and that Bible is, is, is speaking of? Well, Jesus said it the best, of course, Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul and love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. All the law and the prophets are summed up in these two commandments. Accordingly, our lives, our holiness, can be summed up in these two commandments. Loving God first in life means that in everything I am doing, I love him first. This is a big question for us today. This is a big question. Do you love God? Do you love Jesus? Do you really love him? Do you put him first? Where does he come? Where does he come in your list of priorities? This is, this, this is the application that we're reading. You put God first, God first, family second, work third, ministry. Loving God first in life means that in everything I'm doing, I love him first. I put him first before my family, before my business, before my wants, before me. He comes first to do what pleases him. That's what it means to be holy. To see and to hear the world through through his eyes and through his ears and with his heart. How can we do that? Through his word, by reading his word, by studying his word. God reveals himself through his word. The Bible, guess what, wasn't written about you, it was written about God. And when we read and study the Bible, we see how God sees us. We see how we are in light of him and how much we need him, and how much we're in debt to him, and how gracious, and how merciful, and how patient, and kind, and loving he actually really is. But if we don't read the word, if we don't study the word, and we don't know the word, then, then we don't know. We don't know our God, who we profess to be our God. Do you understand that? <laughs> we are sinners. Yeah, we're all sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We as sinners tend to put the thing itself first. Ourselves. We tend to put us at the centre. Right in the centre. Today we find songs, worship songs, that really are putting us in the centre. Songs that say that Jesus loves me so much that I am so precious. It's not about me. It's about him. We have to understand that unholy living, when we want to look at holiness, then let's look at unholy li unholiness. Unholy living does not enjoy God's creation so much. Because it falls short and leaving the person to search and pursue worldly desires. And I think that's pretty evident and, and, and quite obvious. We're grown-ups. We're not youth. We're not teenagers. We're not babies. We are grown-ups. We're adults. And we should know what is right and what is wrong. We should know where and who and what we're doing, whether it's pleasing to God, whether it's worldly, we, we should know that. And we should know when we compromise, because we do, because that's our sinful nature. We make excuses and we compromise. 
and we should know to repent. We should know to turn. We should know when to ask for forgiveness from the one who we've offended. And Jesus was saying in that passage that God belongs in the centre of whatever we are doing. Holiness finds satisfaction and fulfilment in all of our lives when we put God first. That soul satisfaction feeds and grows a passion for life. It feeds and grows a passion to tell others the gospel of Christ. It feeds and grows a passion to weep over those that are lost. It feeds and grows a passion to fellowship with fellow believers and brothers and sisters. It's not a hardship, it's not a tick in the box, it's, it's, a, it's a desire, it's a want, it's a, a, a holy desire. Whereas the worldly, unholy life wants to feed itself on trivial things that are going to pass and fail. Things of fleeting pleasure, nothing eternal. The holy life revolves around God in every place and in every moment. It's a life of passion, a life of fulfilment, a life with meaning and a life for eternity. I think we've seen a lot of application today in these just these few verses, really, honestly. But the biggest application I see would be in, in the question, maybe two questions. Do you love Jesus? Is he first in your life? Only you can answer that. Verse 15, Peter writes to the readers, and today we are the readers, me and you are the readers. But, like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your conduct. Amen. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that it challenges. We thank you, Father, that it upsets us. We thank you, Father, that it worries us. We thank you, Father, that through your word, you teach us, you guide us, and you lead us. That through your word and by your spirit, we can learn and we can make changes. Not our own works, not our own deeds, but we can change because your spirit in us is stronger than the spirit that is in this world. And the more we allow your word and your spirit to lead, to guide, then the more the spirit of the world will yield to us. Father, your word is a lamp unto our feet. Your word is food for our souls. Your word is meat and nourishment. I pray, Father, your forgiveness upon each one of us that hears this word. When we have neglected you, turned from you, delighted ourselves in worldly lusts and pleasures, sometimes maybe even to the extreme, when we have sinned knowingly, when we have walked knowingly into sin, when we have disappointed you, when we have turned away from you, ignored you, to pursue or to do something that's sinful, pointless, frivolous, yet it separates us from you. Father God, I beg and I pray your forgiveness. I beg and I pray your forgiveness and that we 
repent and turn from the un unholy life, an anti-Christ lifestyle and desire that we learn from your word and your word tells us to be holy as you are holy, to be obedient to your word, to be submissive. Father, I, I'm in awe of your patience. I'm in awe of your mercy. I'm in awe of your grace, your goodness and your love. You're, you're, you're long suffering with me and with each one of us. I pray, my Lord, my God, my King, that you grant us again forgiveness, that we may change and reflect our Father who is in heaven. We ask all this in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Redeemer, to his glory, honour and praise. Amen. Well, as normal, we conclude with a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine down upon you and give you peace. God bless you all.